hey everybody, this is Mike, and we are going into demon hunting mode in Salomon Kane from Mythic Games. Now, Barrett already started one playthrough of this one, but I am a big fan of these stories by Robert E. Howard. I've read all of them several times through. So I wanted to take my own hack at the game. And if you don't know what this is, it's an adventure game where you control these virtues trying to help this Puritan kind of hunter of evil named Salomon Kane. And to play the game, you pick a scenario. And I pulled our Patreon supporters, and they wanted to see one that had a two-act structure. So the game has a one-act scenario that you can play maybe 30 minutes to an hour, all the way up to three acts, at least in the base set. So this is kind of in the middle of that. This one is called Skulls in the Stars, and some of these stories are entirely original, while others are based on the original Salomon Kane stories. And this is one of the latter. This is a story that I actually really enjoy from the little collection. And for this video, I'm actually not going to do my usual thing and kind of explaining the basics of the game because I think that is easier shown as I go through the different parts. But I will use timestamps to break up the different sections of the play, so skip around if you like. And if you want to see my thoughts on the game overall, check out my separate review video that should have posted the same day. And I do want to say a quick thank you to Mythic Games for sending me a review copy of this. And remember, if you like what you see on the One Stop Co-op Shop, consider supporting us through Patreon for early access to our videos, listen to our weekly podcast, join our Discord for great game conversations, and check out our second YouTube channel focused on live and streaming plays. And let's jump right in, it's narration time. En route to Torker Town, the shadows of evening draw closer and the sun turns the horizon to blood when Solomon Kane strides into the village. The Puritan is clad in somber black, his broad belt hung with deadly accoutrements, pistols, shot, powder, rapier. Protruding from the cuff of his high boots is the hilt of a dirk. All about the man is the aspect of steel, danger, and grim resolve. The English peasantry eye this austere vision with no small measure of suspicion and fear as it glides through their community. Ahead lie the open moors, on the other side of which is Torkertown, Cain's ultimate destination. For the nonce, he sets upon a hearty meal at the tavern to fortify him, for he intends to travel through the night so that he arrives at Torkertown by morning. Cain ducks under the low lintel of the journeyman's rest doorway to enter the dingy, smoke-filled room beyond. And with that, we're in our first story chapter. The game has both story and scene chapters. Scene chapters actually play out on boards with you moving miniatures around, but story chapters are very, very quick to resolve. And you'll see a few things here. First of all, you've got this diagram. And this shows the starting statistic values. Strength, clarity, and compassion, which are all right in the middle at five, are Solomon Cain statistics. If they go higher or lower, he gets bonuses on some tests. And if any of them go to zero, then he's defeated. Whereas danger helps the forces of the shadow. As it climbs higher, you can have more of these shadow miniatures on the board hampering you, and it also can become a bonus to every enemy's opposing test against you. Another important thing each chapter will tell you is how many darkness cards the darkness deck is for the chapter. This is both a timer and it controls the negative effects that happen to you. At the end of each of your turns, you're going to draw one darkness card and resolve it. And when you resolve the fourth one, in this case, that's the end of the chapter. And what do I have to do in this chapter? Well, how most story chapters work, including this one, is you have this little path of Salomon Cain that has five spaces, and some of my actions will place these little tokens of light upon these spaces, and basically by the time those four darkness cards run out, I want to have this lit as much as possible. If at least the top three are lit, then Salomon's path will be said to be bright, and I go to chapter 2A. If fewer than three of them are lit by the end of the chapter, then I go on the dark path to to be, which will usually make things tougher for me in some way. Now this chapter in particular has some special rules. First of all, it says whenever a virtue takes a move action, they can instead place a light token. So it gives you more flexibility for how you put them on Salomon's path to get a positive result. And also it says place one darkness card onto the cloud. The cloud is a little holding board that usually has positive tokens and dice that you can use for bonuses. Uh, I don't know why a darkness card would go there, but just let the game lead you along. It'll tell you if you need to do something with this later. And then finally, before we get into the chapter, let's look at how you use your virtue board. This is Providence, the solo only extra powerful board. Just to look at the player aid, first you use start of turn effects, which are very infrequent. Then you roll three dice. We're about to do that. You can flip or reroll one die. You form your dice pool. You allocate dice to actions. Resolve those actions. Uh, you can mess around with your action cards. Then you do end of turn effects and you draw a darkness card. 
So we've got these three dice, and you'll see I have three action spaces on my board with specific die values I need to trigger them. And then additionally, every virtue will have two action cards active at a time. Whenever I put dice on one of these to use them, the card goes away, and I have a hand of two cards. I'll pick one of them to replace each spot as they go. And also at the end of my turn, I can just get rid of any card and discard it if I'd like to replace it that way. And very important, you have to put all the dice required on an action in one turn. You can't, like, put one die here and then get another one later. But you can hold some dice in reserve. And for Providence, she can have up to three held in reserve at the end of her turn. Now, a nice thing about story chapters is they're generally very straightforward. All I really care about here is integrity, which lets me move one or place one light, which kind of uh, messes with that nice little scenario thing where I could move to place light. In this case, it doesn't matter. I also chose to start with elegance, which lets me place two lights. Very good to get a leg up on the path. And this interrogation card lets me either do a powerful talk test, but we're not talking right now, we're just walking along the path, or get two white cubes called mercy cubes that are basically wild dice I can use whenever I want later. This one lets me put myself on the board, doesn't matter. This one doesn't matter because we're not talking, fighting, or exploring, so I'm really just looking at stuff with light mostly. All right, here we go. So cross is the best result. It is a wild, and then we have some other things. Uh, this goes with the light requirement, so let me reroll. You can reroll one die or flip one die to its opposite face each of your action phases. Nice. So I'm gonna go ahead and start out with integrity. I need one circle and one barbed circle. I'll use a wild for that. My other wild will go over here in reserve for next turn. This lets me move one or place one light. Now I already said you can cover up light on these spaces to get closer to illuminating Solomon Kane's path. But every spirit also has these little sockets they can put light into to boost their powers. And for Providence, it's super important because the one I'm gonna do, uh, this one in the middle, lets her roll four dice every turn instead of three, which is huge in solo when you gotta get a lot done. All right, and now I would have to replace any action cards that I'd use, but I didn't use any because these you can use over and over again. I can also choose to replace some. I want to cycle through interrogation isn't really helping me much. I could put a fight one that could also get me some luck to uh, basically re-roll when Salmon Kane does something. Or an explore one that can also get me blessings. Uh, sure, doesn't matter too much. I'm just trying to cycle through to my light-giving cards for now. And if you have fewer than two cards, you draw back up. So I got one that can boost up Salmon Kane's statistics at the cost of taking some danger, making the shadows more dangerous. And speaking of the shadows, one of four. Now for story chapters like we're in right now, you just pay attention to the book. It's a quick effect to resolve. Whereas when you're in scene chapters on the board, you resolve the bottom and it shows you where miniatures will move and who attacks you and that kind of stuff. So in this case, I have to lower one of Salmon Kane's statistics, compassion, strength, or clarity. Strength, as you can imagine, tends to go with fighting. Clarity tends to go with exploring. Compassion tends to go with talking. I kind of feel like if I'm in a town, I'm probably going to talk sometime soon. So let's lower strength for now. All right, there we go. Turns should be quick in this game. Okay, let's see. I'm gonna need two hearts. Let's reroll one of those. Nice. Let's see. Do I want to place two lights? Seems like I do. So that's one. And then uh, you can use anything for question marks. So I'll do those and save that same wild for my reserve. So I get to place two light, and this time I'll actually help out Salomon Kane instead of myself. Elegance gets discarded since it was used. And I have to replace it. Let's go with potentially raising my statistics. And my new card can add or remove one darkness so I could give myself more time to light his path and such. It's actually not a bad idea. Darkness number two. All virtues discard their left hand action card. So this one goes away. I will be able to replace it at the end of my next turn, but until then I have just one card I could resolve. All right, back to me. Okay. Um, I can definitely use that for integrity. So let's uh, roll one of the hearts, sure. Oh, okay, that's fine. So I'll do that and use that, and I'll actually save three of these. Because as nice as these cards are, giving me boosted skill tests, you'll see those in the uh, next chapter, I'm sure, and giving me bonus tokens, they force me to lower Salomon Kane's statistics to pay for them. So <laughs> I prefer not to do that until I really need to. And I get up to three light with one turn left, so unless darkness messes me up, Salomon Kane's going to be okay. And I'll get rid of Sagacity and put Guile and Finesse. I might use Finesse to make this go longer to get more stuff on my board. And I get my last two cards, minus one Danger or plus one Light. That's a beautiful one. And this one lets me move two with Salmon Kane or move up the two Light to different sockets. So I could, like, take this and move it over here or put it over on the book, that kind of thing. And our next... Oh, this is terrible! <laughs> one Virtue discards all dice from their reserve. Ooh, it hurts. <laughs> We shall not flinch and we shall not fear. Boom! 
Okay, so I want both of these for finesse. So let's go ahead and re-roll this one. And again, I could just flip it to its opposite side. Oh, wait a second, why did I roll that? I could have used it for integrity. Ah, well. And I am gonna use finesse to add one more darkness card. I know it messes me up more, but more turns seems good. And I'll also discard this one to get to other stuff, which means both of the hand cards I showed you are coming into play. And I draw back my fight and my talking one. Oh no, they're hitting my strength again. Brings me to three strength, remember if I go to zero, I die. And also I'm now at minus one for any strength checks if I take them. So we'll definitely have to make a point about bringing that back up. All right, so this time that's fine for integrity. But I'd love to get like another one of those for courtesy. So let's reroll, nice. Yes, I put those on integrity. I'll also do courtesy. And I guess I'll hang on to those. So let's see, I can lower danger by one or get an extra light. So I can get two light or one light and one lowering of danger. And I'm actually gonna do the double light because as you'll see in a second, even though you just wanna get at least three, the more you get, the bigger bonus you get. I need to fill in a slot. Again, I'm guessing I'm gonna talk in a tavern. So let's uh, put interrogation down. And do I need to resolve? It moves me a lot. I might need to move. So yeah, you know, we'll just uh, keep what else we have and have guile and finesse in our hand for next time. And the final darkness card. All virtues discard their right hand action card. Ah, that was the talking one. Well, it's okay. And that is it. We're now going to resolve the end of the chapter. And by the way, nothing moves, nothing changes. We keep our action cards where they are, our dice where they are. That stuff only gets set up when you begin the game. We got five lights, so Salem's Path is definitely bright. We're going to 2A, but I mentioned that you get a bonus if you do more. So if you have three, you get one modification, two modifications if you have four, and three modifications if everything is filled, which it is. And each modification can raise one stat up or lower danger down. And for now, let's keep it simple. I'll get strength back to where it was and danger down towards the bottom. And now we come to the journeyman's rest. The floor of the inn is hard packed earth, spread with straw. Patrons are grizzled men for the most part, aged prematurely by hard agricultural labor. They murmur into their flagons and clay pipes and dart roomy glances at the Puritan as he approaches the bar. The landlord slams a wooden mug down on the bar top in preparation to take Salmon Kane's order. What do you want? He demands suspiciously. Hot food and ale. Kane grunts, slightly taken aback by the man's rancor. And perchance a civil tongue for a paying guest. Forgive me, master, says the innkeeper. We don't have so many strangers hereabouts, and those that do come... Well, at any rate, I'll bring you pie and ale. Aye, that should suffice to bolster me on my trek. Oh, and where would you be bound, if I may be so bold? inquires the innkeeper. Torker Town, on the other side of the moors. I'll make the journey overnight. With that, a sudden pall of silence obliterates the pleasant drone of the room, and every eye swivels to regard the Puritan. And so we're switching from a story chapter to a scene chapter, and good lord, this is a lot of miniatures. <laughs> what the heck? This is a crowded bar. So it shows me which tiles I'm going to use. These little purple spots are spawn spaces for the shadow. I've got some special token there. And it looks like I'm going to get a free virtue on the board. Even though it'll be someone besides Providence, I just get to put Providence down. And Salmon Kane's here in the middle. I've got an innkeeper and some female villagers and male villagers and a blacksmith. So many guys. But through the magic of editing, boom, everything is ready. And no, I don't paint miniatures like uh, Berenta does, so mine are just gray. But can I just say, this bar is hopping. We got a child in here for some reason. Uh, this shepherd brought a sheep and his dog in. And the blacksmith literally bought his entire anvil in because he has business to take care of and ale is not going to slow him down. But most important people, we've got our first shadow over here. They're going to be charging towards Solomon Kane. They're going to give me negatives to my tests while they're near me. If they get into my space, they're going to force me to draw a negative event card. But blocking them, we've got my virtue on the board looking fabulous. This is Providence. She can act as kind of a wall slash bomb against the shadows. If they move into her space, she can blow that shadow up and every shadow within a certain range. And additionally, if she's close enough to Salmon Kane, she can potentially give him bonuses on his tests. All right, so what else do we have here? We have all these characters. It looks like several of them, the innkeeper, the child, the shepherd, the blacksmith, and the town crier. We can take a talk test to try to draw specific cards to find out something from them. The Baroness and the Dagger Thug have the Seeker Salomon Kane trait, which means they're going to move towards me every round, and if they reach me, I'll have an encounter. I'm guessing a Dagger Thug probably doesn't have anything nice in mind for me. 
And the villagers are scouts. You'll see the darkness cards we draw will sometimes tell us to, like, move them north or south. They just kind of move around randomly. Our objective is to learn about the moors, and the more stars we get in eight rounds, the better we'll do. I'm assuming we're going to get stars from uh, finding stuff out from these people. We have eight darkness cards, and we have destiny cards 600 and 604. What does that mean? So you have these decks of discovery cards that are key to each story you can play that'll give you like special rules and text and such. Many of them like these two will be kind of ongoing effects for a given chapter. While others like the numbers referred to by these uh, talk results when you try to talk to these people will tell you which card to draw to find out what happens. So let's see. Outsider. Unaccustomed to outsiders, villagers twist their faces and glare at the outlandish Puritan as he makes his way to the bar. So that's the ongoing symbol. Whenever a scout in Salmon Kane's surrounding searches, remember those are the basic villagers, uh, if they're in my space or adjacent, that's what surroundings means, they will take away one of my stats. So they're just going to be like bullying me to get out of their town. Or one virtue has to remove all dice from their reserve. And by the way, you can't do a null effect. So if I had no dice in my reserve, I would have to pick this option. I couldn't do that. Meanwhile, the bard's tale. A bard in gaily hued attire strums his lute in the corner and recites an odd story. Kane draws closer to listen. Let's see, at the end of each virtue's turn, if Solomon Cain is in the surroundings of a town crier, place one red onto this card. Solomon Cain gains plus two to talk test when targeting the town crier for each red on this card. Oh, I was wondering about that. Because look, everybody else, I need like a four to talk to them successfully, or a five for the innkeeper. For the town crier, I need a twelve. Basically, he won't pay any attention to me unless I listen to his song for a while. I love it. All right, we got eight darkness cards. Let's jump right in. So now we can quickly explain the other things on my basic board. So move one moves Salomon Kane one. Anytime it just says like move or talk or fight, that's with Salomon Kane. Talk, fight, or explore are the three basic actions. The zero means that he has a zero starting value. And then you flip one of these event cards and you add the value at the bottom, depending on what type of character they are. Salomon Kane gets the biggest bonus. So uh, since these people were like a four or a five to talk to, his average is four. So even a few bonuses should make it easy for him to succeed. And then finally, my right action, as I said, if shadows knock into me or I knock into them, uh, I go off the board, so this will bring me back, and also I can use it to move Providence 1. And the big reason I want Providence on the board besides blocking shadows is that she has an aura value of 1, so she affects her space and all the spaces 1 away, and if I can get a light right here, then she's going to give plus X to all of Solomon Kane's tests. X is how many of these are lit up, although this one has to be lit up to get this bonus. So that'll be a priority to get that, because then he'll have plus two to his talking tests. And then if I can get this third one, first of all, her aura size becomes two, which is how far away she blows up the darkness guys, the shadows, if they run into her. And it's also how far away she can give this bonus to Solomon Kane. So with all that said, let's jump in. And I still have the dice from last time. That is a lot of uh, heart, isn't it? Let's uh, flip one of these instead of re-rolling it, since I know that the black and the white heart go along with talking. So if I want to talk to somebody, actually, I think to talk, I need to move. So I guess I'll do that. Oh, wait, wait, no, 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 I can talk to the child. So I'll use this to boost myself, and those will hang out for next turn. So I can resolve these in whatever order I want. I'm going to place one light on my test bonus. And then I'm going to do a talk zero check, but I'm plus two, because as you'll see, Solomon Kane is within one of Providence. So you can see the lines between spaces. This becomes one big space, by the way. So Providence is here. She's one away from Solomon Kane. And this big space means that Solomon Kane is adjacent to and able to talk to the child. And the child doesn't hold his tongue too well. Uh, we just need a four plus to draw the better discovery card. We've got a two already. Oh my gosh, that was huge. So that is eight, way more than enough. Keen young fellow. The young lad surreptitiously catches Kane's eye. Solomon senses he knows something of import, but the boy makes haste towards the tavern exit. Ooh, the child now is a six or a seven to talk. Dang, I wish I had that uh, great result I just got. But now he's got Seeker going toward that uh, door out of the tavern. And if he reaches that area, then he removes and this card goes away. I gotta talk to him before he gets out. I gotta admit, that's pretty cool. I'm gonna keep my movement one to chase after him, potentially. And then fighting or adding or removing darkness. I don't care about either of those. So I'll just put it down to get rid of it later and get something better. Place two light. That's not gonna help me out too much either outside of a story uh, chapter. All right, now we do our first darkness card, but we're going to ignore the top. This is going to affect characters that are within my surroundings. So that's, again, uh, up to one space away. And then these instructions affect other people that are farther away. And this finally will spawn new shadows. So first we're looking at people within one of Salomon Cain, Scouts and Shadows. Lucky for us, all the scouts, like these villagers here and that lady villager there, are more than one away, so they don't activate. And the only shadow is further east by the door, so nothing happens there. Ooh, but something I did forget, all the Seekers activate. So that means the boy goes one, we'll just have him run over by me so I can definitely talk to him. 
This thug comes over to stab me, and this Baroness comes over maybe to talk to me, I don't really know. All right, now we check the far activations. There are no sentries. The closest scout searches, that doesn't matter because searching only uh, will hurt me if they're next to me. Then the closest shadow moves two to threaten. Threat means they want to be one away from Salomon Kane to mess with his test because they give me minus one if they're there. Then the farthest shadow moves two to engage, and then all hunters move one and fight. There aren't any hunters. So it says the farthest shadow moves two. So I have a choice here. I can either increase danger by one to kind of push him away from me, or I can let him come in and we both go away and I'll have to use three dice to bring myself back, which I think is what I'll do. And a quick but important rules note, each darkness card can only activate a given unit once. So uh, even though they said the closest shadow moves two and then the farthest shadow moves two, it would never move the same shadow twice. I would have to have two different shadows to resolve both of those activations. And speaking of shadows, even though I just took one out, they keep on coming. Space Z, which is right up here, gets a new one. And the only time they don't spawn like that is when there's already as many on the board as the current danger level allows. So right now, if the two could be on the board, uh, if I got it down to one, then only one could be on the board and extras wouldn't spawn until that one got defeated. All right, but it's go time again. Let's see, I think I want to get my uh, Providence back on the board and maybe talk to the kid. Ooh, all right, I got some like opposing pairs. So that would let me put uh, some light down. That would let me talk. This is okay, I think. I'm not going to change anything. Although actually, I guess I don't need to move right now. I would like to put that down, but <laughs> I need three dice of any type to get Providence down. So let's do all but my wild there. So I'll get Providence back on the board for plus two and then I'll talk again. Well, you know, should I? A seven talk, even with a plus two, it's really tough. Maybe I'll hold off and build up. So let's not put Providence on the board. Let's do a move and save that for later. Or wait, sorry, no, I want to put Providence on the board, but I won't talk yet, I'll just move. Because here, if I go over here, while I am putting myself in danger from all these townsfolk, I'm also next to the bard, so I'm going to get to the first uh, little bonus token for him. I'll get Providence back here to boost him, or just to stop that shadow from hurting him. I'm definitely going to ditch Finesse and try to find something better. Honestly, this one isn't bad because these green ones let you redraw a test, uh, the luck tokens. So that's helpful. Oh, and so it would be some stat bonuses. I could get my compassion up, which gives me a consistent bonus of talking. Alrighty, and let's see. Uh, the child moves into my space. The knife guy moves in. Oh, and the Baroness is here. Let's see what she has to say. The pickpocket. An attractive, well-dressed woman approaches Kane. Well, I think I know what she is now. Thanks for the title. Fixing her gaze on his eyes. She bombards him with chatter, and Kane begins to wonder if this is some kind of ruse. If clarity is four or less, it is not. I'm five. Take that. If it's five or more, she changes. I can now talk to her. Okay, so that remains in place. So she's uh, not messing with me anymore. I like it. More options to make stuff happen. But we gotta do our darkness card. Okay, one scout moves east. And when it's tied, I can pick which one. Although it has to be one that is within one of me. Uh, shadow moves to engage. That won't happen. No hunters to fight. Oh, you know, I forgot to give me the bard's bonus. So that'll make him... I would need a ten now to succeed. If I hang out a few more turns, it'll be pretty easy. Gosh, there's so many townsfolk around. Let's send uh, this female villager down here. Okay, a faraway scout searches, but that doesn't hurt me because it's not the ones next to me. The farthest scout moves one towards me. The southernmost scout moves two north. And then uh, the closest shadow moves one to threaten. Let's see all that. This guy's the farthest, so he'll go one there. And then the southernmost scout, so it can't be him, moves two north. I think every other scout is within one of me, so that's not going to do anything. And the shadow moves one to threaten. That is going to do minus one to my test. Darn it. And we get our second shadow, the most we can have right now on Y. All right, let's come back over here. Huh. Okay. That one would be fine for talking. Let's reroll this one. Uh, that's not great. Well, I could place another light to get plus three to all my tests, and then I could talk and save that. Let's try it. And actually, the Baroness is way easier to talk to than the kid, so I'll wait a second on him and talk to her. We need a 5+, plus, so a 2 or higher is fine. 3 will do it. Not fooled for a moment. Solomon is wise to such trick and sharply grabs the lady's arm. I have nothing you need, lady, but perhaps you know more about the Moors. More about the Moors? <laughs> the lady winks at Solomon and tells him to have a peek at the ledger by the bar. So we get plus 1 clarity. That levels us up a little bit. We're going to place one of these clue tokens adjacent to the innkeeper. Uh, the little Baroness card goes away, she goes away. Oh, and if I'm on that space, I can do an explore test to find something from the ledger. On a six or less, I just get rid of it. On a seven plus, I'm sure I'll get some of the stars to help me out. Although it's not great that instead of actually getting the stars I need, I'm just like slowly uh, finding other ways to get stars. And let's see, the bard likes me a little better. But you know, it doesn't like me anyone else, including this pickpocket and this child running away. Oh no, it's like my last chance. 
Okay, he's not trying to kill me, he's just a drunkard. A well-oiled patron barges into Cain, spilling his own drink. Adeline in rage, he squares up to the Puritan. Oh no, minus one strength, I'm back down to four. And let's see, I can either punch him in the face or try talking to him, and he's going to keep following me around until I do one or the other. Oh man, okay, this time we are going to search, because there are scouts near us. A different scout is going to go west one. Now, there's like a billion scouts. Which one do I want to go west? I guess one of these guys up here could get out of the way. Remember when they search, they can either take away one of my stats or uh, my reserve. That seems much better. Okay, now let's see. The farthest scout moves one towards Solomon Kane. All the rest doesn't matter because the only shadow... Oh, no, that's right. We do have a second shadow, so they're going to move two to threaten me. And let's see. The farthest scout, we've got kind of a tie. We'll move her up. And this shadow is going to move two, so... I guess like one, two... So darn, he is uh, <laughs> also giving me a minus one to my tests. Oh, that's right. So was the other one. Luckily, I beat the test by more than one to talk to the Baroness, and she is gone. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I forgot. I'm actually going to get rid of both of these. I need to get something that lets me talk better. So I get the stuff that raises my stats, and I'm going to place more of those. All right, darn it. That child is about to get away. I just got to walk over and talk to him. Oh, that is great. I'm just going to keep all of that, because look, that's the move I want and the talking. The reason I want to move is right now I'm adjacent to two shadows, but if I move into his space, I'm still within the order of, of my virtue, but the shadows won't give me a minus. So I have plus three, and I need a seven plus. So on average, I'll get this. And yes, we are good. Let's find out what he has to say. Tale of the Haunted Moor. Solomon catches up with the lad and places a firm hand on his shoulder. Unwilling to say too much, he nevertheless warns Cain that the Moors are haunted and he should instead bunk with old Ezra at his shack in the swamp. Cain is intrigued by this tale of haunting. Oh, we get an extra darkness card, more turns, plus one compassion. That gets us close to talking bonuses. And two stars. Awesome. That's a good start. Although, <laughs> if we stop now, we're still at the worst result. Okay, we remove 602, remove that token, remove the child. Okay, so we're just kind of clearing up. All right, my friend the drunkard just continues to bug me. <laughs> and let's see. I actually do want to do dignity to boost my compassion. I guess I'll put sagacity in place of elegance. I got my moving one back. Where's my good talking one? All right, another scout is going to search, and I don't have any uh, dice in my reserve, so I'm going to have to take a damage. And I want strength in the lower, and I'm close to getting compassion to be good, so let's take my exploration clarity one. And let's see, two scouts not adjacent to me, each move one east. This guy and this guy. Oh, wait, and the northernmost scout moves two south. So these guys are not next to me anymore, so I guess she'll go. And then the farthest shadow moves two to threaten, so not going into my space. That would be to engage, and we aren't spawning because we already have two. The farthest one has to be this one, so he's going to run in. And she blows up every shadow within her aura, which is two right now. So all these guys are gone, which means never mind. I guess we are uh, doing X. Right, let's see what I want to do. I want to talk to the drunk guy. I could also talk to the blacksmith. And if I stay one more turn next to the town crier, I'll have the easiest time in the world talking to him. So let's see how we do. We got no dice saved. I kind of like to save one at the end of this turn so that we avoid uh, taking another damage. I could talk or I could bump up my compassion to get a bonus to talking. We still got a little bit of time, so let's do this. I'll do boop. Oh, I guess I'll... Yeah, I could have re-rolled one of these. But I'm pretty sure the villagers are going to take all of it anyway, so we won't worry about it. Oh, wait, wait, I forgot. This card is way better if I'm on the board. Look, it increases danger by one and gives me plus one to one stat. But I get to do it again if I'm on the board, so I don't want to waste it yet. All right, so never mind. I think I'll just try a straight-up talk. Or now maybe... Yeah, let me get myself back on the board, and then I can uh, reserve a die for if they attack me again. And I don't want to lose my bonus again, so I'm going to go over here and let the shadow probably move on to Kane and mess him up. Right, in terms of dice, I still like dignity. Let's get rid of sagacity. Put in, I guess, moving faster. And still no talking bonus, although this would let me redraw if I get bad cards. And right, let's see. A scout searches. So, yep, we lose our die. Another scout moves east, and the shadow is going to attack us, which will draw an event card. So one scout moves east. Let's get this uh, lady who's right on me, I guess. And when the shadow engages, he does come off the board. That's the good part. But like I said, you have to resolve this negative event card. Mental impasse. One virtue removes all dice from their reserve. Well, <laughs> I don't even care about that. But minus one clarity unless the Temerance miniature is on the board and she's not in the game, so nope. But we did spawn a shadow in Z, but that's pretty far away, thankfully. All right, I got lots of people I can talk to and I'm running out of time to actually do it. <laughs> so let's reroll this. Hey, that works. And we'll keep two wilds. I guess I'll talk to this guy. So I've got plus three, no minuses. I get a four, which goes to seven, and I just needed a six, so nice. The Virtue of Sobriety. Cain pushes the drunkard back, giving him a sound dressing down for his behavior, and advises practicing sobriety in the future. Oh, the Puritans. Oh, so I could have put myself on the board for free, and I get to choose any one bonus. Compassion, strength, or danger. I'll go for compassion. That's a plus one to all my talk checks. 
And that woman runs up to Kane and apologizes for her husband's behavior. We got our third star, so we're not in the bad result anymore. And then this goes away. Ooh, Dagger Thug and the nearest female villager go away. Ha ha, get out of here. That's this guy, and we'll go ahead and make it uh, this one. And by the way, I'm the best audience this bard has ever known. <laughs> I now would need a two to successfully talk to him. And with my uh, virtual on the board, it's basically automatic. But on the negative side, we only have uh, two more rounds after this. Ah, another scout searches, I'm going to lose both of my wild dice. I hate you. Okay, and other things that happen, I get to pick two scouts to move south. I'm going to get these guys out of my way. Shadow moves one, no problem. But another one comes out over here. All right, so let's see, I can talk to the blacksmith or the town crier, and then I definitely want to move, because then I won't be next to any scouts. That'd be very nice. That was a fun die roll. <laughs> So that's good for the moving, and that's good for the talking. I'm fine with all that. So I actually talk to the blacksmith and then move to the town crier, because again, that way the scouts can't get me. For the blacksmith, I get a three, plus three for my virtue, plus one from raising my compassion, so I'm at seven. You look a strong one. If you can beat me, I'll buy you a drink. Kane replies, I'm not thirsty, but you can tell me about the moors. Okay, we discard an event and take note of the nemesis number. That's one on the right, so the strong one like Kane. If it's lower than or equal to my strength stat, which is four, so I have a pretty good chance, I'm victorious. If not, I guess something bad happens. What are we like arm wrestling? Let's do it! Ha ha! <laughs> Finally, I'm happy to draw a low number. So we get 639. Quick as a flash, Kane slams his opponent's hand to the table. Oof, you are a strong one. Salmon briskly asks the man what he knows of the Moors. I daren't venture there of late. The noises, the crackling, and the bodies. Cold sweat beads his brow, and genuine terror makes this bruiser's voice waver. Oh, cool, I get a star, and a white token member is a wild die. I can use at any point it hangs around between uh, chapters, and the blacksmith is gone. Okay, and then before the villager can attack me, <laughs> I'm going to go hang out with my best musical friend. By the way, can I just say that I sort of love that uh, as I go around, I'm clearing out the bar, so my puritanical nature is making me get rid of everyone who's in drinking and enjoying themselves. <laughs> it's awesome. And I guess I'm still going to keep my same actions. I'm not going to have time to talk to anybody else, I don't think, or, well... Yeah, you know, having the... I like being able to boost my stats and be able to move far. Because I got the extra darkness card, so actually I have uh, two more turns still after this. Okay, scout searches, but I'm not next to any. Ha ha ha, take that. Okay, but the farthest scout moves one towards me, then the westernmost scout moves two east. Then the farthest shadow engages me. Ah, man, she's going to blow up with Providence again, but I guess that's okay. All right, so every scout is one, two. So I'll have her move next to me since I'll probably be leaving. And then I can have this guy move to east, because I don't care. But again, the shadow blows up with me, bye. And that's about it, and I've got uh, a ton of people with the uh, shepherd down here, so besides that, things are pretty cleared out. And we can easily talk to the town crier, like no matter what we draw, we'll succeed. So let's try and make that happen. Okay. Um, I want that, I don't want both of these. Let's see what we can do. Okay, there we go. And I could move, but I think I'll save these in the res- Oh no, no, that's right, there's a scout next to me, so I am gonna move as well. You know, I did forget about this shadow. He's trying to get next to me, and then another one pops out here. But I think my plan stays the same. I'm going to talk to the town crier and move over here. With my bonuses, I'm at like 17, even with the minus one from the shadow. The bard's song is about an old man whose house is made of fungus, and he himself transforms into a poisonous mushroom. <laughs> Could such a story be based on truth, Cain wonders? No, it was Alvin Cain. Uh, all virtues place, ooh, a die of their choice into their reserve. I'll certainly do a wild, or maybe, I wonder if it's like a random roll. No, I'm just going to say it's a wild. Ooh, and two stars. It gets me to six. I got the best result, and the chapter ends immediately. Bye-bye, town crier. Thank you. All right, I guess I'm just a persuasive guy. 3A. Fork in the road. The innkeeper places a platter of piping hot game pie and vegetables at a rough wooden table for Kane, with a foamy mug of ale and a hunk of bread and butter to the side of it. The Puritan concludes his investigation to fill his belly. Cain reflects as he chews that he learned much of the curse afflicting the Moors from the patrons of the journeyman's rest. If they are to be believed, then some dire supernatural force is at work. He cleans off his plate and tosses some pennies on the table before stalking out of a tavern. Remember, Puritan, the landlord calls out as he steps over the threshold. Take the swamp road. Cain pauses, considering the warning, then is gone into the night. Soon after departing the village, Cain arrives at a fork in the path where he can either heed the villager's warning and take the long road through the swamp or strike out across the moors. Cain could face whatever force haunts the night, but it would be well to reach Tarkertown unmolested. The choice is his to make. Right, so let's see. Having gathered enough information to make an informed decision, Salomon heeds the villager's warning and elects to take the swamp route. Minus one danger. That'll bring me to one danger, which is awesome. 
Or, suspecting the foul play on the moors to be the work of the devil, Cain gathers his strength and heads for the moors, his hand firmly gripping his rapier and pistol. Plus one strength is not a bad thing, because I'm down pretty low. But, I mean, the kid told me to go to the swamp. Everyone told me to go to the swamp. Let's go to the swamp. Minus one danger, 6A. The road less traveled. With his mind set, Solomon Cain changes course of the fork and heads down to the swamp road. The sun sets as he descends into a low, flat basin. Huge and blood-red, it sinks down behind the sullen horizon of the moors, seeming to touch the rank grass of the fens with fire. So, for a moment, the watcher seems to be gazing out across a sea of blood. Then the dark shadows glide from the east, the western blaze fades, and Salomon strikes out boldly in the gathering darkness. The trail is indistinct and overgrown, winding between islands of scabrous reeds and pools of dank water, and black oozing mud that threatens to swallow whole the unwary traveler. Stars blink out and night winds whisper among the reeds like weeping specters. The moon rises, lean and haggard like a skull among the stars. In the distance, a yellow glow flickers like a beacon as a nightlight is turned on. Surely this must be the shack of Ezra the Miner. The glow fades and vanishes once more as thick ground mist rises from the mire to obscure Kane's view. So we got to explore these things. Wow, we need a 10 plus to succeed. But then I'm guessing that'll be how we find Ezra. We got 13 darkness cards. Wow, that's a lot of turns. And some discovery cards. And what we got? Swampy terrain. With each step, mud splatters as Solomon's boots and cloak. Oh, up Solomon's boots and cloak as a sharp putrid stench assails his nostrils. Ooh, we cannot flip dice. We can only re-roll. Interesting. In the search for Ezra, Cain has been reliably informed that an old hermit called Ezra lives out here in the swamp, and he will offer the Puritan shelter for the night. So whenever a clue token is removed from the board, place it onto this card. Oh, we get plus two explore for each one. Okay, so we're supposed to fail several times and then eventually do it. Okay, if I do not find Ezra after I remove all of them, I suppose, then I go to the negative result. Let's not do that. In case you're wondering, here's our much simpler, much less crowded little board. We got a single shadow, me in the middle. I can run up here, get my virtue on the board. Shouldn't be too bad. All right, and here we go. Solomon Kane and the Swamp Adventure. <laughs> Let's see if we can find this guy. And they finally let me keep a uh, die. Okay, and I can't flip. So let's reroll what I have a double of. Okay. So all of the explore tokens are far away. It seems to make sense for me to run. So boop. And I have to use both my wilds, but that's okay. So I'll get to move two spaces and I'll hang on to these for exploring later. Um, one, two, three. Yes, okay. So clearly they're all three away. So uh, the shadow's down there. Let's just get as far as I can. I still want to increase my stats, even though I know I probably should have gotten rid of that. Fight for or add remove darkness. I just want my good explore card. Yeah, they're definitely only minus one danger right now. It's only uh, one danger anyway. Speaking of danger, there's be some quick AI cards. Oh, it moves three to threaten? Come on, Shadow, what are you doing to me? One, two, and he caught me quickly. Three? But the nice thing is, since danger is so low, he's the only one that's going to be on the board for now. All right, let's see if we can explore a bit. That's a nice little roll. Um, I don't want two of those, so... Okay. Hmm. Okay, so I guess I want to move and explore... I'm not really planning to succeed at this first one. I was trying to uh, get those bonuses for exploring some. So I'll move away from the shadow and try this one. I need a 10 and I got a 4, so let's resolve the fail effect. Shifting mists billow up from the mire to obscure Salomon's vision. Has he been here before? There's no sign of the hut he seeks. Oh, move tile 18A with spawn point X and any miniatures on it so it's connected to Salomon Kane's current area. Very interesting. Then spawn a shadow at X. Great. And that does break the rule, I believe, of the limit of spawns. Okay, then I remove the token and place it on the car that gives me a bonus. Now, it's already connected to my area. I guess it must mean, like, connect actually to my area. So, let me put everything, like, a little bit higher like that. That seems to make sense. And another friendly shadow for us. And let's see, I'll definitely replace Guile with, I don't know, the danger one. I got my super talk card. Where's my explore card? Come on. I imagine these guys won't be very nice. Yeah, the first shadow engages me and blows up. The other one moves one next to me. Boom, and boom. And that means minus one strength unless the courage miniature's on the board. And then plus one danger or remove one light. So I gotta say I'm getting pretty weak. I think we gonna lose a light. I like that my danger is so low. So let's get rid of the plus one aura size for now. All right, back to me. I think I get my virtue back on the board so we can just get, like, eaten up by them. Ah, yuck. That's a lot of the same thing. Wow. Well, let's use our doubles and, like, weirdness to get me on the board. 
And the rest will just hang out for next turn. Now I'm going to go right here, just expecting to blow that guy up. And let's get rid of Courtesy. Put down the talking one. <laughs> Shuffling out the danger one right back. Oh, but nice. The uh, saddle doesn't actually move, so I don't have to lose myself yet. All right, let's have to roll a little better here. Oh, I like it. I like it. Um, hmm, I already have one of those. I have all this stuff. Oh, yes. So I definitely need to get moving if I'm ever going to get anywhere. All right, I would like to finally <laughs> increase my stats back out of uh, the terribleness they've been in. And then I guess these three can hang out. So this card increases danger by one, but then I get to increase two of these. So let's get strength where it's not terrible, and let's actually do that twice. I mean, what's the bad part about moving? I'm leaving the protection of my uh, virtue. Oh, well. Okay, put down the minus one danger card. Get the fast movement card. I'm okay with that. And we got lucky again. No shadow attacking, although Z is spawning, but that's away from where we're going. All right, here we go. I like that. I like that. I don't need this. Okay, so let's see if I can move one, increase my aura size again, and then explore. Maybe I can uh, find this thing. So let's see, that would increase my aura size. I don't think I'm going to have enough, though. Yeah, okay, so never mind. I will still move, and then I might as well try to explore. But let's uh, save this stuff here. Or actually, you know what? I got a better idea. Let's move me into uh, Salmon Kane's space, because I think the shadows are going to attack. Or I'll move into his space, but I'll be close at least. All right, so he moves here. He only has plus two bonus from the first token he found. So the five would not have been enough. Ah, if I'd gotten a plus three bonus, I would have made it. So same thing happens again. I have to move X adjacent to him in some way. So I guess let's do like that. I don't know. I don't think there's any way for it not to be, yeah, within one of him. That's how they set it up. So maybe move myself is not useful. I guess we'll see. Ah, dang, another shadow is moving to engage. And then uh, the farthest shadow moves to to threaten. This guy's attacking me. And this one's moving too. In the event, remove all dice from your reserve. Joke's on you, I don't have any dice in my reserve. <laughs> but I do go up to three danger. Well, that makes me kind of happy that I use all my dice. Okay, we'll roll the one that I... Oh, nice. All right, so I want to keep on moving Kane. And then I'm going to use these to get my light back. So that way, look, he moves here, and then next turn he can go there, and I'll be within one, two with my increased aura size to help him. I'll add the fast movement card in there. Wow, still no explore card. Okay. All right, shadows, leave me alone. Closest shadow moves one to threaten. That is not too bad. I could go one, two, three, one, two, three. So I can choose. I don't want her to mess with me because I'm going to try to win. Okay, here we go. All I need is a move and an explore. We're going to make this happen. That is fine. I'll take it. So I'm coming in. I've got plus three from my virtue. I've got two of these. That's plus five, plus seven. I just need a three or more to succeed. And boom, barely got it. And yes, no shadow is next to me, so no minus one. Awesome. Oh no, we aren't done. <laughs> uh, Ezra's hut, a ramshackle hut encrusted in leprous fungi, rises from the swamp before Cain hesitantly approaches. Place tile 19, so it's connected to SK's current area. Okay, remove the uh, card with all the clues, add four more darkness, place a clue onto the terrace area of the hut. When I'm in the same area with that token, he can take an explore test and knock on the door, a talk test to announce himself, or a fight test to open the door. Wow. Well, talking is what I'm best at. I still have a bonus for that. Oh, and I've got the good talking card down, so a six plus will be nothing to me. All right, so here we go. And boop, we got our little door to knock on. There's still fun shadows chasing me. Ah, it says closest shadow moves two to engage. So I'm going to take an event, and then this one moves three to threaten. Man, they are just hounding me. Of course, I'm not really defending well enough. Okay, all virtues without their miniature on the board discard one active action card. It's not going to affect us. And plus one danger. Darn, we're at four. Almost two uh, where we can have three guys on the board. And speaking of another shadow spawns on X. But hey, look at this. We can move two, which will get us right to the house. And then we can talk four. So that's just two turns and we should be able to win. Okay, that's a good start. I want that. Um, I don't need that. Oh, perfect. And then boop. Okay, so we'll be able to move two. I'll save that one. Hopefully the dumb shadows won't catch us. For my new card style, I'll put the place to light in there in case we get one of those uh, story ones where we just uh, have to place light. Oh, now I get my explore four. Thanks, game. And okay, the closest shadow moves one to threaten. That's entirely fine. There you go. And let's do this thing. Oh my gosh, that is a lot of wilds. Now the negative about doing interrogate, even though it's a huge bonus to talking, is that I lose one compassion. So it actually be worse at talking in the long run. But I think I got to do it, so... That's one, two, three, and I can save two of these. Not bad. So my compassion instantly goes down to where I don't have a bonus anymore. But I'm plus four and five more. Darn it, would I have succeeded with plus one bonus? Yeah, I would have. <laughs> Come on. 
Who's there? Ezra's door creaks ajar, and a face like an old, gnarled tree trunk peers out nervously. Ezra invites a Puritan into his hovel with a misshapen smile. Plus one clarity? Okay, that's nice. That's my most damaged one. And I place one light on any room for it. Solomon asks the old man what he knows of the haunting up on the moors. Ezra seems hesitant, but nevertheless maintains a friendly facade. Okay, we finished the chapter. Go to 8A. Nice. Chapter 8A of Dangerous Aspect. Fearing the glint in the Puritan's eye and his collection of weapons, Ezra tells Cain that a ghost haunts the moors and preys on travelers. It may be nonsense, but Cain is convinced Ezra believes what he is saying. He heads out to the moors to investigate. The sun is long gone and inky darkness permeates the land. Then suddenly Cain stops short. From somewhere in front of him a strange and eerie echo, or something like an echo sounds. Again, this time louder. Cain starts forward again. Are his senses deceiving him? No! Far out, there pealed a whisper of frightful laughter, and again, closer this time, no human being ever laughed like that. There was no mirth in it, only hatred and horror and soul-destroying terror. Then, from the murk ahead, a figure staggers into view, ragged and loose-limbed. In his haste, the figure almost collides with Cain, who seizes and steadies it. It's a man, a traveler, gibbering in terror, gibbering, 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 and bleeding profusely from vicious slashes on his arms and back. All right, we're back to a story one, which is good, because I want to try to uh, get my stats up a little bit higher. Four darkness. And ooh, I did have elegance prepared with two light. Let's make it happen. I can finally flip things again. Wow, that was like the worst. <laughs> um, you know, I guess it's okay, because I can go like that and that and just use both of these. And what the heck, might as well do that too. Boom, boom, boom. Three light in the first of four rounds. Feel pretty good about that. Uh, elegance goes away. Might have time to kind of stock up. Yeah, I could get some more mercy cubes. And don't forget, I do have one of those, which can be a while whenever I need it. And this could give me some blessings. Uh, remove darkness. I don't think I'll need that. Darkness card. I lose my right hand action card. That's the one I was going to play. Why do they hate my interrogation? No worries. No worries. Okay. Uh, hmm. That's not great. All right, so I can't even do integrity? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Man, I can't do much of anything. Jeez, and without my right hand card, that would have been perfect. The hearts would have gone with it. Okay, well, I'm just going to have to literally throw away a die. Unless, do I want to use my mercy now? It's like kind of a waste, but I also hate to waste a turn, but uh, so it goes. I guess I'm just losing one die. I don't take away my reserve card. Oh, remove one light, the jerks. Yeah, we'll do it from here. We still got turns to get it back. Right, I forgot to place one of these. I guess this one that gives me some mercy cubes potentially gain. Ooh, elegance came up. Maybe I'll get that again. But first, let's try to not roll terribly. Okay, that's that's a little better. I'll flip that, I think. Maybe I can definitely get one. Let's see, clarity and strength are both a little weak right now, but I feel like I'm going to need to fight this demon, right? So let's go boom and boom. And I guess I do have to use that. So I lose one clarity. It brings me to four. But I get to draw two blessings and keep one. You haven't seen these yet. These little bonus things, you can use them whenever you want. Plus one strength, clarity, or compassion. It's not bad. Although, you know, <laughs> as silly as it might be, I kind of like the move. Because you can use these, like, whenever. So I could even, like, use it uh, when a shadow is about to get me, I think. I'm not sure if I can interrupt an action. Yeah, I mean, it says when in doubt, allow a blessing to be used. So I'm going to assume that it works like that and keep it. But that card's gone. We'll put elegance in its place. Second to last, Darkness, discard an active action card. Get rid of Guy, I want to keep Elegance. And let's try to indeed be elegant. Oh, that is a nice roll there. Yes, yeah, so we'll do one, two, three, four. That'll fully fill up our light. And we're great and set up for next time. And I got Interrogation and Finesse back. And we have to all remove one die from my reserve. Not too bad. All right, easy peasy. I'm getting three bonuses again, then going to 9A. This will be the last one of this act because uh, 10 is always like the little ending. For the three boosts, let's get danger down. I don't want to be able to get three shadows at once. Let's get clarity to a safe place. Maybe strength up one because I figure I'll be fighting. Ooh, and look, I get a minus one additional danger. It's down to two. That's just a bonus for, I guess, getting the best result. Name of the devil, curses Salomon Kane. Who has done this? Some being was hunting this man to his death out there on the fan, and what manner of horror God alone knew. Cain, his flesh crawling, visualizes some ghastly fiend of the darkness crouching on the back of its victim, crouching and tearing. The sweat stands cold on Cain's forehead and body, keeping horror on horror in an intolerable manner. 
God, for a moment's clear light, but his hellish half-light veils all in shifting shadows, so that the moors appear a haze of blurred illusions and stunted trees and bushes seem like giants. Then, like a hand of ice on his spine, he is aware that they are not alone. Cain looks up, his cold eyes piercing the shadows from whence the traveler had staggered. He sees nothing, but he knows, he feels, that other eyes give back his stare. Terrible eyes, not of this earth. He straightens and draws a pistol, waiting. The moonlight spreads like a lake of pale blood over the moor. Of one thing Cain is sure, there will be no hunting of him across the dreary moors, no screaming and fleeing to be dragged down again and again. If he must die, he will die in his tracks, his wounds in front. All right, so first we have something special. We're going to put the Omen card in with our 14 Darkness card. Man, 14, that's a lot. And if that's ever on top of the Darkness pile, it gets drawn first and will resolve. Looks like a Destiny card. Yeah, Omen D634. And then we'll also draw a Darkness card. So it doesn't, like, cancel out the Darkness for the turn. Let's see. If Salomon finds and defeats whoever attacks the Traveler, I get three stars. And if the Traveler dies, I remove one star. So I guess I got to save the guy and defeat whatever it is for th the best result. But again, either way, they're going to be a uh, 10. Let's see. Shrieks of the night. Hideous shrieks and frightful whispers fill the night air and echo around the moors. Cain cannot pinpoint the source of the devilry. With each scream, Salomon closes in on the source of terror. Okay, whenever a explore token is removed from the board, place it onto this card, and then place a new one two areas away from Salomon. So, man, I'm going to have to move a lot again. But I, again, get plus two to explore test for each one on the card. And let's see. I need an eight or more to explore. Oh, I get two discovery cards for that. And the Traveler is wounded with health three as a follower. And what those keywords mean, uh, number one, follower means that every time I move, he'll move as well. But wounded means he can only move one. So if I, like, move two, I'll actually leave him behind to, I guess, maybe <laughs> get killed or something. All right, interesting. I do start on the board, kind of, like, right in the middle. Salomon Cain and the Traveler are down here. Just one shadow. And that's my first exploration target. All right, all right, let's do this. So for now I have no faster way to move, no better way to explore, so I'm just going to trudge along. That's neither of what I want, is it? <laughs> Let's reroll one of them. Okay. So we'll just uh, move one and reserve the rest, I guess. You know what? I'm just going to get rid of both of these because uh, I do have my move two card and I want to get to my better explore card if I can. Salmon's walking and so is my buddy. And we can look quickly. Ah, moves three to threaten and then they summon on Y. So we'll go one, two, we'll get him over here. That way if I move, he won't actually be able to stop me exploring better. And this guy's over here. All right, for this turn, I definitely want to move one and then explore. So that'll be fine. I can flip that. That's all fine. And I actually didn't need to use my reserve stuff yet. Although, you know what? You know what? Let's do it anyway. Because maybe we can knock this thing out in one. I got one danger, but that's one that lets me increase my stats twice if I'm on the board. I'm going to get clarity up to seven. I'll have plus one of the explore, plus three from my virtue, plus four. I got a chance. So I move, so does my follower, and that means the shadow will not give me a negative. And woo we got more than a chance. Four plus four is eight. Awesome. Let's see. No human being ever laughed like that. There is no mirth in it, only hatred and horror and soul-destroying terror. Cain halts. He is not afraid, but for the moment he is almost unnerved. Okay, increased shadow threshold means now we can have three shadows, even though uh, danger is not that high. Ooh, we get a free heart. Ooh, plus one clarity. Now we're really good at exploring. And we remove that token. There has to be more. Yes, Gideon appears. The shadows melt and Cain sees two hideous eyes flame at him. Eyes frightful and insane with a malevolence transcending earthly insanity. <laughs> He's more insane than insane. Uh, the form of the thing is misty and vague, a brain-shattering travesty of the human form, like yet horribly unlike. Okay, so we get rid of the car, we get rid of our clues, time to fight this guy, Gideon. Uh, so he's a nemesis, a hunter, he's coming after me. Health, four, that's a lot. Oh, he's up next to me. Okay, we get these fight cards, we're going to see a fight finally, right at the end of the act. And if the travel's on the board, we'll also have D637. And if this card was revealed through the omen card, Gideon immediately fights. Okay, so it sounds like he would have shown up whether I found him or not once the omen happened. Cool. Let's see, I think this is our boy Gideon. He says he wants to give us a hug. Come on. Uh, let's put him kind of away from the shadows. All right, first I'll show you the fight cards. Literally, this is the same as every other test in the game. Uh, you have to be adjacent to somebody to fight them. And here we have one for Cain. We have one for Gideon. Some have a little flip symbol. So every time Gideon attacks, he's going to flip to like a different version and then flip back after he attacks again. 
And based on your fight's test and how well you do, you'll get some like little flavor text, and you'll reveal one or more of these fight effect cards that uh, hopefully will deal damage to the enemy. This guy has four health, remember, and eventually take him out. And we got some other cards. An understanding is they tumble about in the morning, rise and laps his limbs like a serpent of smoke. Solomon's flesh crawls and his hair stands on end, for he begins to understand its gibbering. Uh, during fight test, virtues also add the compassion modifier, which is currently zero. Darn it. Oh, interesting. Look at this. This is an action we can use, an extra one. Uh, for every wild we put here, we get plus one compassion. For every circle we put here, we get plus one strength. So we can keep on boosting our stats, and plus one compassion will get us the bonus for attacking. Okay, the Wrath of Gideon. Cain feels icy fingers gripping his limbs, bestial talons tearing at his garments, and the skin beneath. He drops his useless sword and grapples with his foe. It's like fighting a floating mist, a flying shadow armed with dagger-like claws. Uh, Gideon is immune to damage unless compassion is five or higher. Mine's at six, so I'm cool on that. And then finally, this is just because we kept the Traveler alive. The Traveler wails in terror at the sight of the ravaging specter and attempts to flee. In sense, the ghost pursues him with grasping, rending, bloody talons. Okay, so this, by the way, uh, there's a few cards that are ratted. It's really pretty minor. But this guy has three health. They thought he died too easily with two. So he's a coward. That means every round at the end of my turn, he's going to run away towards the board edge one. And if he gets off, he leaves. He can only move one. We already know that. And he's going to hunt the Traveler instead of me, unless we're in the same space. You'll see, like, his hunter cards tell him to uh, go after us, basically. I guess he runs away this way. And we have another Darkness card. Okay, so this hunter fights. So he gets a 5 plus whatever event card he draws. So 5 plus 3, because he's a nemesis, so he also uses the same right number as me, is 8. Although, actually, no, it's 7, because the danger modifier applies to every person taking a test on the opposing side. Ah, but it doesn't make a difference. We almost made it to the lowest value. Gideon swipes with his steely talons, shredding cloth and flesh alike. So you look at 24, 56, and 6. Okay, so I lose one strength. On the X, I'm bleeding. Uh, the next time I move, I discard this card and lose one strength, unless I use a die to get rid of it. And then Twisted Wrist, I have to discard one of my action cards. That's not a big deal. I don't think I'm going to move much, so let's uh, get rid of this one. All right, now lucky for us, we just have the one shadow moving to threaten, so not too terrible. And actually, you know what? Let's have it move here, because then if we want to, we can move into Gideon's space and uh, have it be further away. All right, so my turn now. Remember, I've got some extra options. I can get rid of the bleeding. I can gain more compassion and strength. Let's see how we do. Let's see, I could get plus two strength if I put both of those on there. And I don't have to move yet. I could just bleed for a bit. So, uh, sure, let's uh, do that. And of course, I want to actually fight him. And I could move away or do something, but I think I'm okay keeping those for next time. So I gain two strength, so that means I'm going to have a plus one to my fight, then I have plus three for my virtue, minus one for the shadow next to me, so plus three overall. So let's show this guy who's boss. Four, so that's seven. So that's the middle result, not too bad. Solomon desperately grapples the dagger-like claws of the ghost, fighting for his life. 45, 54, 11. And I forgot to say, getting an attack, so he'll be a bitter next turn. See, oh, switch areas between the attacker and their target. I'm okay with that. I'm sure the shadow's gonna come in and knock me away. Oh, wait, 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 hold on. Ah, uh, my friend. <laughs> okay, and place one on the target. Ah, two if I had used a cross to activate this. Uh, and he only has four life, so that would have been half his life if I had done that. Darn it. And let's see, if I'd gotten a high result, I would have gotten some free compassion. That's good to know for next time. All right, so the villager's running away. There's a good chance Gideon will attack me since he's still next to me and not kill that guy. I'll just hope that happens. Yep. Oh, fights with a one? That's much easier than last time. <laughs> so he gets only a five. That's the lowest result overall. Gideon's eyes grow hellish in the moonlight as his smoky form sends his target reeling backwards. 15, 14. Move the target one area away from the attacker. That'll trigger my bleeding and I'll lose one damage and discard that card. And days. For the next fight test, the target must use the crowd rabble number and discard this card. Oh my gosh. So I'll get like the left value that's super low usually. But hey, silver lining, I guess I'm further away from the shadows. Speaking of the shadows, the closest one moves two to engage, and I can actually have them go around me. The farthest shadow moves three. Now I'm going to have him hit me. Boom! Both gone. The new one does pop up over here. All right, my turn. I want to smack this guy. We're going to use our blessing. Remember that to move one? Because I got my fight plus four card, and I want to use it. Okay, that seems pretty good. Let's flip one of these, so that'll be boom, boom, boom. I do lose one strength, I go down to five, so I'm just not getting any bonus. But I get to fight with four, and then I guess I'd rather have my person on the board. That'll give me plus seven overall. I'm going to go ahead and put her in my spot, I suppose. And we're using the lowest value, but it is enough. Nine is the best I can do, and nine is what I got. 
As Gideon begins to materialize in the mortal plane, Cain leaps to take advantage. 11, 55, 49. All right, 11 we've seen. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Up to 10. I should have gotten plus one compassion last time. And that means my result actually would have been 10 this time. And then I'm plus another compassion. So I'm at eight compassion. Nice. Let's see, Epiphany. All virtues place one wild in their reserve. I don't mind if I do. And coup de gras. One damage. Or minus one strength and three damage, which will finish him off. Grah! <laughs> Does bring my strength to a pretty low level again, but I'm looking great on clarity and compassion. Not bad at all, and danger is still low. This is good. So yeah, with those three, he is defeated, and we get to read the most positive ending of Act 1. Let's see what it says. While the Traveler flees to safety, Kane drops his useless sword to grapple with his foe. It's like fighting a floating mist, a flying shadow armed with dagger-like claws. His savage blows meet empty air, his lean, mighty arms in whose grasp strong men had died sweep nothingness and clutch emptiness. Naught is solid or real, save the flaying ape-like fingers with their crooked talons and the crazy eyes which burn into the shuddering depths of his soul. Cain fights with his arms and his feet and his hands, and he's aware at last that the ghost gives back before him, that the fearful laughter changes to screams of baffled fury. For man's only weapon is courage that flinches not from the gates of hell itself, and against such, not even the legions of hell can stand. And reeling and gasping, he rushes in, grapples the thing at last, and throws it. And as they tumble about on the morn, it rises and laps his limbs like a serpent of smoke. His flesh crawls and his hair stands on end, for he begins to understand its gibbering. He does not hear and comprehend as a man hears and comprehends the speech of a man, but the frightful secret it imparts in whisperings and yammerings and screaming silences sink fingers of ice and flame into his soul, and he knows. All right, major victory. Nice. We get a free luck. Remember, that lets us uh, draw again by discarding it if we get a bad draw, like on a fight or something. We get a free mercy. That's our second two wild dice that's waiting for us. And a free blessing. And we go into the next act, story 1B. All right, here we go into act two, Gideon's Tale. Solomon Cain knows. He knows the great wrong that spawned this hell-born demon of smoke, rage, and vengeance. He experiences all as a maelstrom of emotions, mixed up with flashes of memory. First, there is confusion, an innocent soul, given to maniacal outbursts, sent from guardian to guardian, with none willing to care long for such a challenging ward. Even its own mother abandons it. Finally, it finds peace in the swamps, away from other people, under the guardianship of a loving uncle. But then comes resentment, anger, cruelty, an escalating spiral of shame and hurt that the simple soul cannot comprehend. Eventually, the guardian relents. He is loving and nurturing once more, and the soul is overjoyed. A journey out onto the moors, the joy of the open countryside, alongside the most important person in the soul's limited world, a crooked tree bent from exposure on the open fen. Closer to it, encouraged by the guardian, the loving protector. Then a red flash of searing pain. Betrayal! Heavy blows hammer down from behind, helpless, paralyzed, engulfing darkness. And then rage, blind, hysterical, all-consuming rage that sought to tear, bludgeon, rend, and destroy the betrayer. By night, the spirit arises to haunt the moors, unable to find its murderer. All mortals are subject to its wrath. Its name is Gideon. All right. And oh my gosh, look at this craziness. Plus two clarity, plus two compassion, minus two danger. That is the reward we get for having a positive result. Man, that is a straight up kooky duke right there because we have now full compassion, full clarity. It's plus three to talk checks, plus three to exploration, and the lowest danger? <laughs> I mean, we're not very strong, but as long as we don't have to fight much, we should be tearing things up now. And there's another straightforward one. We have four turns. We gotta get to five light. Shouldn't be too hard. Oh, and whenever a virtue takes a move action, instead place light equal to the move value. So if we get our two move card, we could actually uh, use it for a bonus. Yeah, if we were just snowballing our way to a potentially easy victory, we've got elegance ready to place a ton of light. Uh, do, 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 do. Um, hmm. and that would do that. And then no, I don't have four for that yet, but... That's okay, I'll just hang on to these for next turn. So that's one light to start. You know what, I will get rid of courtesy and put out sagacity. I'm fine losing one clarity when I'm at 10 to get another blessing. Oh, we lose our left hand action card. Elegance, no! No worries, no worries, we can still get this. Okay, that works <laughs> very well indeed. Still have one wild hanging out. So I get a second light over here, and I lose a clarity. 
I get my choice of two blessings. Oh, this is easy. Place an available virtue onto the board. That costs three dice. I guess I'm going to pick that one. And when I didn't show you, at the end of Act 1, I also got a free blessing, minus two danger. But since it's already at its lowest level, I don't know if I'll be using that anytime soon. And I got to replace both my actions. I got my talking one that also gives me wild dice and extra darkness. And, ooh, I'm losing clarity, strength, or compassion. I guess I'll go for compassion since that's also a 10 right now. Uh, let's see. Okay. <laughs> that's not necessarily great. Let's reroll the heart. That's a little better. All right, so we'll get one of those again. And, huh. Yeah, I guess I'll lose a second compassion, but that'll get me um, two more mercy, two more like dice I can use on anything that's wilds. Although we'd already have two and the max is three, so I'd be kind of wasting that. So you know what? Never mind. I'll just uh, lose one die. Not a big deal. And just put the light down. And I'm going to get rid of finesse because I've got this move two card in this scenario that would get me two light, which is just what I need. Oh no, discard all dice from my reserve. I hate you. That's okay, I just want to get Resolve off if I roll well. Uh-oh, I'm not there yet. Come on, come on, come on. No! So I do have what I need for Integrity. Do I care enough to use one of my white dice to get Resolve? It'll get me to five lights or three stat boosts instead of two. Yeah, why not? I'll go and use one of my uh, Mercies. And boop, and these will hang out for later. That gets us to five light unless the last darkness messes it up. Nope, plus one danger. We are at uh, something besides one now. So we easily light Kane's path and we get three moves. I think maybe I want to do strength. Uh, sure, let's do all three in strength. I'm not going to lower danger because remember I have that blessing that can lower it twice. So I'll let it increase one more time and then just bring it right back down to rock bottom. Pursuing Gideon. Solomon Kane reels back, shaking to clear his head of the flood of alien images, memories, and sensations. It's like an assault on the Puritan senses. And for a moment he knows not his own soul from this wretched manifestation of hate. Kane is shaken to its very core, then the bond is broken and he regains control of his faculties. He looks up. The rolling cloud of black smoke and piercing embers seems to fold in upon itself, diminishing in size, defeated by the superior will and courage of the Puritan. Beaten, Gideon flees across the moors, flowing over the undulating terrain with the speed and grace of a flock of low-flying night birds. Cain does not even allow himself to wince at his many cuts and bruises, knowing that he must follow Gideon to his point of origin if there is to be any hope of putting an end to the horror that haunts the moors. In the shifting darkness, determined not to lose sight of his quarry, Cain gives chase with the speed of a famished wolf. Alright, this is going to be fun to film. We've got this super long vertical set of boards to go on. This is going to be all about movement, I assume. Uh, Gideon has a seeker, and he's got this uh, goal at the top, so he's going to move one space every turn, basically. So I want to reach that green towel before he does. Oh, or not before. Losing sight of Gideon. Not limited by the undulating terrain of the moors, and we already read that. So we get four tokens on this card. At the end of each Virtue's turn, if Salomon Cain is not on the same tile, not the same space, but just the same tile as Gideon, I remove one token. Whenever there is zero on this token, I have lost Gideon. And if we're both on the tile with the green, oh, we don't have to reach the space, just the tile, then we succeed. And then Guiding Lights. Though Salomon be fleet of foot with the alacrity of a cat, he struggles to keep pace with the ghost. The Virtues must guide his path. Okay, so Virtues may place light into areas on the board. If Salomon Cain enters an area containing light, remove the light and move Salomon Cain an additional area. If I enter the same area as Gideon, Gideon immediately moves one, so he gets an extra movement, but I get plus one clarity. So I just kind of like run next to him, and if I want to outpace the uh, shadows and darkness, I can try to use lights to go even further. All right. All right, so I've only set up like the first three tiles as we proceed north, and the other ones become less important. I can kind of remove them. And I can't run straight north, because that must make Gideon go faster. But I also don't have any of my cards that place extra light or my extra movement card. And the effect that lets me move is also the one that lets me place light. So darn it, I'm kind of locked into that for now. But so be it, let's go. All right, that's definitely good. I don't need two of these. Let's re-roll. Oh, well, great. Okay, I got all these extra dice. I might as well put myself on the board, right? All right so I'll move here over next to him. The only shadow is way up here, so I don't know. Let's just kind of... Protect Salmon Kane a bit. Well, maybe more like there. I don't know. All right, and then Gideon moves one. We don't lose anything. And the Darkness card only moves the Shadow one. Although he also spawns a Shadow on a Salmon Kane, so we just immediately draw an event. I lose one of every stat and plus one danger. Yeah, that uh, that wasn't great. <laughs> so before my next turn happens, we can use my minus two danger go back down to one. So we'll only have uh, one Ghost at a time, one Shadow. And we got to get to uh, Light and Movement. So let's replace both of these. Oh, and there we go. Much better. Next turn, we can put these in and get some light going. But for now, 
All right, we can move. I'll flip that and save these for next turn. I'm going here, he's going there. The shadow moves to, um, see, I guess I want to go ahead and blow him up now. And yeah, because the spawn spot is behind us. That'll give me some time to get ahead of him. Here we go again. This is a pretty straightforward little race. Um, I don't need two of those. Okay. So that'll let me move. And then sure, you know, let's go ahead and increase danger by one to get my stats back up. And I'll replace this one as well. So now I've got a way to lower danger and a way to play some more light. Right, so I think danger went up to three or did I miss an addition? I don't know. And then what the hell? Let's get everything at eight. That seems pretty good. Sal moves up one, so does Gideon. And we still count as being on the same tile since this uh, space bridges it. Pretty lucky for us, this shadow just moves at one, and a new shadow comes in here, so we can just get away from him. This will be the turn to do it, I think, pretty easily. Let's flip that. So we got our move, and then let's go ahead and place two light on the board. Yeah, this is gonna let us burst ahead. We'll go like that, and then one, we get a free move, two, we get a free move. We are way ahead of the guy now. Because he just goes blip. I'm perfect. We have my move two card resolved to fill the empty slot. In fact, if we're going fast enough, maybe I want to run into him just to kind of speed up the end of the scenario. As for the shadows, this one just moves it too. Bye, guys. All right, I added the next tile. We just need to get off of this tile and then onto the next one. See, I think I might have to make him move faster. So let's see. Okay, definitely like those. As for these, I don't need them. Let's reroll. Okay. So I could do that one. Yeah, why not? Let's uh, get it done. So I'm gonna place uh, two light. And yeah, instead of moving, because I want Gideon to come to me and get some free movement, I'm gonna like put them up here so that uh, I can like burst forward once he catches me. So he's there. And one of the stragglers, I put them to the side. It goes that close, so within two of me. And all right. Okay, I definitely need uh, doubles. Ah, uh -huh. all right. It's a little annoying, so I can do that one. And I think I'm actually gonna put myself on the board in case that shadow rushes me. All right, I'm gonna put another light here, which should take me all the way to the end, basically. And I'll go ahead and put myself right in Salmon Kane's space in case the shadow comes calling. And Gideon moves one into my space, but the card says if I enter his space, he moves again. So I think I have to wait until he moves again and then kind of follow him. I didn't need myself yet. This shadow just got onto the same tile as uh, us, or one behind, I should say. All right, so I think at this point I'm actually good. I'm just like waiting, so I can just kind of store some stuff up. What is that roll? Gosh. <laughs> Great. All right, so I'm just gonna store these three and do nothing else, and I think that's okay. Because Gideon walks right onto my little chain of spaces. Now, as for the shadows, this one would charge in, so I blow him up, and this one gets right next to me, but I will be long gone. And we just try for one final trick. They do spawn a shadow there, but again, it won't matter. Because here we go, I just need to move, and oh, <laughs> I'm actually not gonna take any chances. Let's flip that to make sure I can move somewhere. What do I do with all the rest of these? Oh my gosh. Yeah, I don't have crosses using any of my cool stuff, so I guess I'm just losing them. And to show what happens, I move here. Gideon runs away, I get plus one compassion up to nine. I move again, he runs away, I get compassion up to 10. I move here, I'm on the tile, so is he. He's showing me the tree where he was killed. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant clarity, not compassion. So I have full clarity and I am done with the scenario. And it's another quick story one, the rotting crevice. Guided by Gideon's ghastly ethereal clamor, Solomon Kane goes deeper and deeper into the moors until at their very heart he comes upon a little used trail. A head gibbering and tittering outbursts from the unquiet spirit echo hollowly. Then a ray of cold moonlight pierces the clouds to illuminate the plateau before Kane. Atop the plateau, a great oak tree rears up like a gibbet? Gibbet? Gibbering, gibbering, oh my gosh. A jagged crevice is plainly visible where the first bows split away from the trunk like the twisted arthritic fingers of a decrepit crone. Kane recognizes the tree from the visions imparted to him as he grappled with the enraged phantom. Against all reason, Kane finds the reserves of physical strength and stamina to run again. He runs to the tree and pulls himself by the lower branches. Up close, the tree is rotten, dead, a skeleton on the moors. Within the crevice by the moonlight, Kane spies the unmistakable glint of bone. He clears accumulated dirt and grime away from it to expose the skeleton of a young man, its skull viciously cleft. Ooh, this is the evidence he needs to bring Gideon's murderer to justice. And so we get one mercy for free. That's again, a free pool on skills. And we gain or remove light equal to the compassion modifier, which is currently plus one. Oh, so we start with one and we have four turns to get the rest, easy. Yes, yeah, so let's just uh, crank through this pretty quickly. Okay, one, two, that'll give me one light. And I guess I'll flip this just to make sure I have the light for next time. Darkness card is plus one danger, we're up to four. And I guess since I don't need these, I'll replace both of them. Although nothing's too interesting, I want extra light placement. 
Alrighty, so I can do that again. And let's reroll this guy. Oh, nice. You know what, sure, I'll go ahead and do interrogation. Why not? So I'll lose one compassion, I'm down to seven. But now I've got all three wild dice chilling on my board. And I'll replace finesse as well. Oh no, minus another compassion, we're down to six. But no worries. All right, that's a good start. Let's flip that. That'll get us to four light, by the way. But yeah, I'm not sure I want to use any of these other effects, so we'll just skip that die. Ooh, courtesy, minus one danger. I do want to get that in play. Let's replace sagacity with it. Oh, minus one strength, I'm down to seven. All right, last turn, let's see if we can get to five. I imagine we can. Uh, let's flip this. So we got that for integrity. And yeah, I can go ahead and lower uh, danger back down to three as well. Once again, we're perfect unless darkness messes with us. Nope, <laughs> they just push danger right back up. So this will give us three advancements. And let's see, let's go. I feel like I'm probably gonna have to talk to people soon. So let's push compassion all the way. And it looks like I was right, an impromptu jury. Dawn's fiery cauldron spills its molten light across the eastern horizon as Salomon Kane strides purposefully back to the village. The cockerel crows a harsh reveille, greeting the Puritan. The few villagers out and about at this hour shrink from the sight of Cain, wondering if this dark apparition of blood and rags is the ghost come down from the moors to enact a final murderous outrage on them all. Cain pounds on the door of the journeyman's rest. Landlord, he bellows. Landlord, open up. The shutters fly open on the inn's upper floor, and the innkeeper's bleary, irritated face appears over the windowsill. Who's there, damn you? When he sees Kane still pounding on the planks with the heel of his fist, the innkeeper's eyes widen and his head quickly ducks back behind the shutters. Seconds later, the door opens and the innkeeper in his nightshirt ushers Kane into the tap room. He sits Kane at a table and orders his wife to bring hot water and linen to clean and bind the Puritan's wounds. What happened to you? The innkeeper asks incredulously. Never mind that, says Kane. I know why no man can cross your moors by night, and I know how to lift your curse. Gather the village folk. There is a terrible wrong that must be put right. Okay, so yeah, it is a talking scenario. We have to rally as many people as we can. We want to get miniatures on D707. I'm assuming that means we got to, like, talk to each person. we got the innkeeper, shepherd, blacksmith. Oh, and villagers. Interesting. They're still scouts. They're going to move around randomly, but I can talk to each of them individually, it looks like. Path of the Righteous. Cain commands the crowd with his stern baritone, admonishing the people to do right and seek justice for poor Gideon. Okay, during the outcome phase, I get a blessing for every three villagers on this card. Cool. And we're back in the inn with a crud ton of people again. Cool. All right, once again, there's just a few people here. So let's see, if I move one to get within my two range, or I'll have plus three, I have plus two compassion. That means even the tough tests against the villagers will succeed more than it will fail. So let's try to, like, move here and start talking to people. And I've got all these dice plus three uh, saved dice. Okay, we can flip that. That'll get us the movement. And this will get us the talking. And, oh, I can do like a super talk. Um, oh, I don't have all the stuff for it yet, but we'll save that for later. All right, so let's go here and talk to this villager first. Ooh, two plus five is seven, which is lower than the best result. Let me use one of my two redraws. So I discard this and go again. And three will do it. Still drawing low, though. Rousing speech. Kane's talk of ending the bloodshed invigorates the crowd, and two more townsfolk step up to the cause. Ooh, I get two. Remove up the two villagers from Solomon Kane's surroundings and place them on a D707. And ooh, I get a level up two. I'll do uh, compassion to get my talking bonus to plus three. And I get to place a die, but I don't have any room in my reserve, so whatever. But that was awesome. Two out of the, what did I need? Like six? Yeah. But we draw a card, uh, villagers might move, and then the uh, guy might come for me. Yeah, the big thing is the shadow moves three to threaten. So I'll actually have him be there. And that way, if I move away, he won't bother me as much. Now, let's see, I got a bit of scout movement. This guy can come down here, and she comes here, and boom, I should be set up for another, like, two-for-one deal. All right, so I don't need to change much this turn, I don't think. Um, okay, so I got that. Uh, let me flip this, since I already have another one ready to go. And then I still can't do my bonus talk, unless I want to use my uh, white dice, but, I mean, everything's going fine so far, I don't think there's a need. So let's come over here. The shadow is not adjacent. So I'm going to get plus three. I now have a plus three bonus. So I'm plus six. So I need to not draw a one to get a double villager deal again. So let's try for that. And indeed, it is not a one. So it's the same card. We'll just go ahead and take away two of these guys. And I get another level up. Jeez, I'm running away with this. I'll note, by the way, that you can self-balance the scenario difficulty at any time. Because anytime you start a scenario, you can replace some of the darkness cards with these really, really rougher nightmare cards. But I kind of like being awesome, so for now, we'll just keep it how it is. And so let's see, one scout moves north. The easternmost scout moves to west. I mean, they're all kind of staying next to me. And then this guy moves one to threaten. We'll just leave him behind again. 
All right, if I can just pick up two more villagers, this should be the last turn pretty easily. So we'll do that. We'll flip that. And yeah, I think uh, we're fine. We don't need these other dice. I don't need to do a special talk. So let's move right here. And it's not a one. We are good. That was easy. Thank you all. My strength is up to nine. And you'll see the little book symbol for six plus miniatures. That means we immediately proceed to the end of this. Ooh, you know, actually it says you finished the current turn. I feel like I might have cheated on that a few times. Oh, and you know, I also forgot that I could have had a second uh, shadow this whole time. So just to punish myself for cheating a bit, let's just draw an event card and say that one of the shadows reached me. Ooh, reveal a random sin card. Ha ha ha. Gluttony. An inordinate desire to consume more than that which one requires. The virtue sends a hunger for more rising in Solomon Cain. This affects the efficiency of his actions. Oh, I gotta spend any die extra when performing any action, but then I can just get rid of it with a light. I mean, <laughs> that's barely an issue because it's so easy for me to get light, but we'll just keep that for the next chapter as kind of a penalty again for me for getting some rules. And I'm realizing I didn't get the unique effects of talking to any of these cool villagers, and not just the basic people, but so it goes. Here we go, confronting Ezra. Remember that uh, nice old guy in the swamp? Maybe he's the one who killed his nephew. The hut of old Ezra the miser stands by the road in the midst of the swamp, half screened by the sullen trees growing about it. The walls are rotting, the roof crumbling, and great pallid and green fungus monsters cling to it and writhe about the doors and windows as if seeking to peer within. The trees lean above it and their gray branches intertwine so that it crouches in the semi-darkness like a monstrous dwarf over whose shoulders ogres leer. The road which winds down into the swamp among rotting stumps and rank hummocks and scummy snake-haunted pools and bogs crawls past the hut. Many people pass that way these days, but few see old Ezra, save a glimpse of a yellow face peering through the fungus-screened windows, itself like an old fungus, or an ugly fungus, maybe both old and ugly. <laughs> Such is the face that presents itself to Solomon Cain and the throng of villagers by his side as they approach the shack. Fear glitters in its roomy eyes and the lips quiver as it ducks away from the window frame. Right, so we gotta defeat Ezra to get a star, he might try to escape, and if we go to the green space we have an encounter. Oh, okay, so I just gotta, like, rush over there. And for discovery cards, we got that swampy terrain again where we can't flip dice. That's annoying. Head count. Ezra's hut lies before Cain. Smoke billows from the wilted chimney. Someone is home. Oh, jeez. Place all miniatures that were placed onto D707 into areas within Cain's surroundings? Oh, and darn, if we had the shepherd with us, we wouldn't have had the swampy terrain. And if we had the blacksmith with us, we would have gotten free dice. And they're all companions. What that keyword means is whenever I take an action, they take it immediately after me for free. So basically, as I move forward, they'll just walk with me. That's right, Ezra, we're coming for you, and this time I brought my whole crew with me. So mention him possibly escaping. I assume we have to, like, cut off his advance. All right, let's uh, get some light to get rid of gluttony. That's, wow, nice roll. <laughs> That's my uh, first priority, so I gotta use an extra die. Unfortunately, that's my movement one, but that's okay. I'll just uh, save these for next turn. I'll throw away both of these because I want to get some movement faster. Ah, oh, there we go. Move two. That'll be great. I'm going to place the light on Gluttony, so that's gone. And nothing much happens except the shadow moves at three to engage. Ah, oh, which would mean he blows up my guy, but that's okay. Nice thing, though, is that there was no spawn on that card, so we have no other shadows, at least for a turn. All right, let's get over there as fast as we can. Do that and that. And... I mean, we got the crosses to spare, right? So there we go. So we can move up to three. Don't forget each of the villagers can as well. So I'll go one, two. I just hope that uh, nobody spawns on me again. Three, uh, one, two, three, one, two. Maybe they should like spread out. Maybe I'll like leave that guy there. One, two, three, one, two, three, sure. Uh, one, two, three. One, two, she'll be in my spot. We got this stuff covered, right? And nothing can- Are you kidding me? <laughs> of course, they spawned right on me. I get an event card. Okay, discard my right hand action card, which is elegant, so that's fine. Plus one danger puts me into five, so three shadow max. Oh, but I get a free blessing? Okay. I uh, place one light, not too impressive. You know, did I flip a die last turn even though I wasn't allowed to? I feel like I did. So let's like reroll this wild and force myself to have something not as good. All right, let's keep on moving. That's good, so no flipping. Let's remember that. Let's actually go ahead and summon my friend. So Solomon Kane will go there, and boop. I assume we have to like cover all of these tokens, right? That would only make sense. And I'll go and put her right here. Or actually, no shadows will move this turn. Let's put her here. And this time a shadow spawns on wide. It's a little bit above where we can see. Now it's gonna take one more turn to reach the guy, but that's okay. 
Hey, <laughs> nice rolling. I'll re-roll that one. Okay, we'll do that and that, and... Well, you know what? Let's go ahead and lower danger back to four. And we'll get this guy on that one. This guy on that one. Um, I guess, Bo well, she can hang back. This guy can go to that one. This guy can go to that one. And I'm here, so we have a villager on every single space. And then uh, hopefully I can go in there and knock this guy out. All right, the shadow moves two to threaten and no spawn again. Wow. So uh, I guess he'll just be here, but my virtue is ready to blow him up if need be. All right, we'll move in and see what happens. Um, hmm. That's actually not terrible. Ooh, that's even better. <laughs> now we can move, and I guess we'll just hang on to these until we see what we need to do. So I'll go here, I'm still gonna leave her back, and we'll have our encounter. As the villagers surround the hut, which we did, <laughs> the tension becomes palpable. Cain approaches Ezra's moldy old door. Remove that token, roll a die, and place Ezra in the same area as the corresponding objective token on the board. Okay, if a cross is rolled, minus one strength, move all mortal miniatures in Ezra's area into adjacent areas. Um, or we get a free reserve, or we spawn, and we get some new cards. Interesting. Okay, Dark Heart. Uh, so spawn a shadow at X, Y, and Z. Yikes. All right, so, Rabid Madman. Ezra bursts through the door of his hut and, waving his staff like a rabid madman, looks to avoid the thrall of oncoming townsfolk as he makes his escape. Uh, there's a minor errata, it should say Sentry one, so he'll move with Sentry effects on Darkness cards. He has six health. And if Ezra has two or more damage, he'll move one area less during his activation than indicated. And the cornered animal, Salomon Cain and the villagers grip and tear at the rabid old man as he fights his way through the crowd. So whenever he enters an area containing two mortal miniatures or Salomon Cain, he takes a damage. Whenever Salomon Cain or the blacksmith, I wish I had him, <laughs> moves on to him, he takes a damage. And whenever Ezra has six, we immediately capture him. He's trying to get back to the west where we came from to escape. I'm actually not sure which miniature represents him, so I think this guy, like, crazily wandering around sounds good. And what was it? Dark Heart? Ooh! Great one to have. He's going to have to move on to Salmon Kane. Nice. Right, so let's see. Sentry moves two. So he will move uh, into my space and pass me. But that's totally fine, because that's one damage, but not two, because I need two villagers to deal damage to him. And I'll clearly be moving into him in a second to slow him down. Now we do have a ton of shadows, and this one's supposed to threaten me, which means she blows up. But that'll take care of all of these. We just have one shadow down here. Not too bad. Although we do spawn a second one to join him. All right, my uh, surrounding him didn't go quite the way I maybe should have done it, but that's okay. I think we're still gonna be able to get him. So that'll move me. And then I don't have another double movement or anything, so I'll get uh, Providence back on the board, I think. So I'll move into his space. That's one damage, so now he'll move less. And then I want to put up little blockades of two villagers. So we got two there. And we can bring these people over as well. All right, I think he's going down. He only moves one because he's hurt enough. Oh, and I forgot to put uh, myself down. We'll block the shadows. But yeah, so he moves here and he takes a third damage from the villagers. And one of the shadows moves and they all get blown up. But a new one spawns right here, a bit more annoying. All right, let's finish this up. Oh, what a great roll. So boop, boop to move. And sure, let's bring me on board to protect against the shadow again. So Salmon will go here. That'll be four damage. Uh, these villagers will do an automatic five to him in a second. And yeah, this will be done very quickly. And we'll put me right here. Oh, and whoops, he doesn't move at all. So uh, interesting. But the shadow does try to engage me and gets blown up. And a new one spawns down to the bottom. So, huh, I guess I gotta like move off of his space just to uh, get back on it later. That's uh, okay, I guess. So I'll move here above him, that way if he moves this turn, he'll go into the villagers, and then I can come down and do the last damage. And there we go, sentry moves two, that'll take care of him, and the shadow's gonna go two to get me. So can't quite reach me, so we're fine, that's his fifth damage, I just gotta move. Although I will remember that we have to finish out the turn, so I'll put Providence back on the board so I don't get hurt. So boop, 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 and yeah. We'll give him a six point of damage, and we'll put her here, so it doesn't even matter what card I draw, the darkness coming in will just get blown up. So we got him! And here we go, a nice quick one for our penultimate moment. Diverse forms of justice. At last their quarry stands before them. Old Ezra the miser partakes much of the quality of the swamp, for he is gnarled and bent and sullen. His fingers like clutching parasitic plants, and his locks hang like drab moss above eyes trained to the murk of the swamplands. His eyes are like a dead man's, yet hint of depths abysmal and loathsome as the dead lakes of the swamplands. Over a year ago, says Salomon Cain, 
You, fearing that your insane cousin Gideon would tell men of your cruelties to him, brought him away from the swamp by the very trail by which we came and murdered him here in the night. Ezra cringes and snarls. You cannot prove this lie! Cain bids a youth from the village forward who empties out the contents of a burlap sack before Ezra. It is the skeleton of a man, the skull hideously cleft. Before he can react further, at a signal from Cain, the villagers seize and quickly subdue the old miser. Okay, so we get a free redraw, one of his luck tokens. Ooh, we get a choice. Bring Ezra to witness the consecration of Gideon's remains and have him fully account for his sins in public. Um, and my danger is not six or above, so I'll go to 8A. Or take Ezra to the site of the murder and tie him to Gideon's tree for the ghost to administer its own justice. 9A. Well, <laughs> I've read this story and they picked 9A in the book, so I'm going to pick it too. So here we go, our final scenario to finish up this whole thing. Gideon's tree. Old Ezra is bound and Cain and the villagers set out for the moors, chivying him along in their midst. They experience the uneasy sensation of being watched as if by death itself. Finally, they come to that gnarled, dead tree atop the moor, where the murderer concealed the body of his victim. What will you do with me? Ezra mumbles. A hard thing it is, says Cain somberly, to sentence a man to death in cold blood and in such a manner as I have in mind. But you must die that others may live, and God knoweth you deserve death. You shall not die by noose, bullet, or sword, but at the talons of him you slew, for naught else will satiate him. At these words, Ezra's brain shatters, his knees give way, and he falls groveling and screaming for death, begging them to burn him at the stake, to flay him alive. Cain's face is set like death, and the villagers, the fear rousing their cruelty, drag the screeching wretch to the oak tree, and one of them bids him make his peace with God. But Ezra makes no answer, shrieking in a high, shrill voice with unbearable monotony. The villager makes to strike the miser across the face, but Cain stays him. Let him make his peace with Satan, whom he is more like to meet, says the Puritan grimly. Tie him to the tree. All right, so we got to get him to the tree, it looks like. Okay, so yeah. All right, that seems easy enough. Okay, so he's a follower, so he'll go after me. He has a fight check. Interesting. Oh, and the villagers are followers, but they're also scouts, apparently, so I guess they'll kind of wander around a bit. I got to explore the tree to win, but then I also need to tie him to the tree. Oh, that's weird. Wait, so I can win? Okay, well, let's look at the discovery cards. I'm sure they'll explain more. Seeking their own form of retribution, the villagers maim and kick Ezra, trying to hurry him toward the tree. Come on, people. Whenever a scout searches, ah, they move one area toward Solomon Cain. Whenever a shadow engages Solomon Cain after resolving the event, villagers take a fight test against Ezra with a base value equal to the number of villagers in the same area as Ezra. This is cool. So if Ezra's defeated, I gotta do 723. I don't think that'll be a good result. The ghost needs to kill him, people. Okay, restoring order. Cain attempts to calm the crowd down as he intones the list of Ezra's sins. For if they kill him, then there is no justice. Okay, for each red token on this card, Salmon Cain gets plus one to explore tests. Oh, okay, okay, I think I get it. So I need to do this final explore test to get my actual ending, and I think by talking it to the villagers, because they have a talk stat, then I can maybe get the tokens to get the pluses. So yes, that makes sense. All right, here we go, ready to go. I've got like a gauntlet of villagers all around me. Three shadows hanging out by the tree. And just because things are going so on, I do want to show you can make the game tougher. I've replaced every darkness card for this scenario with a nightmare card. So every round, nastiness is going to be <laughs> waiting for me. It might be too much, but I think we can handle it. All right, so I think I want to move away from the big majority of them, but start doing talking tests as well. And I have this plus four explore card. That would be four, seven, ten for my clarity. So honestly, I have a decent chance of passing the main test uh, with just maybe like one or two talk tests. So I'm going to mainly be moving toward the tree. Right, that was a good roll. I like that. And then, yeah, let's uh, just start talking as we go. Okay, so unfortunately, they're followers, not companions this time, which means they all move one space towards me. Oh my god, they're going to kill this guy. And I'll try to talk to one of them. I do have Providence on the board. I still have plus three compassion, so that's plus six. So that's a ten overall. Definitely the best result I could get. Yeah, I only needed a five or higher, so basically I couldn't fail this. Okay, in control. As things grow increasingly tense, Salomon must control his cohorts and bring this matter proper justice. Okay, move all scouts in the same areas as Ezra, one area away from him. Nice. And I get one token. Remember, that's a plus to my final explore check. And I get a free wild. Yes. All y'all get back. <laughs> I'm going to keep the Explore card, but I want to try to get a faster movement card, which I don't have yet, so I'll just keep cycling through until I get it. Oh, that was fast. Nice. I got it as my next card. Right, but here comes the Nightmare. Unlike for the regular Darkness cards, you always do the top effect. Okay, so either replace two Darkness cards with Nightmares. Well, too late. Or plus one danger and minus two to one of my stats. Well, I can do Strength pretty safely. That'll be okay. 
But as I said, this makes things a lot tougher. And then one scout moves west, but nobody uh, searches or whatever to tries to attack him. And then all shadows move three to threaten? What? Right, so let's see the scout, whatever, you can go here. Or no, I guess uh, that's still west, so let's get him further away. And three to threaten. One, two... Oh man, that'll blow me up. Oh wait, wait, yes, ha <laughs> look. I'm within two spaces, boom, 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 take that. Of course, Nightmare cards also spawn more, so they're back on X and Y, which is here and all the way up there. Okay, but no worries, no worries, we got this. All right, I got the movement. Let's uh, talk again for sure. And I don't want to explore yet, I'm gonna get rid of that card, so I think, ooh, do I want to put Providence back? Well, now there's only two people and they might not reach me this time, so we'll hold off for now. So I'll talk first before I move. Although I guess they'll follow me, so it won't really matter. And yet with my plus three bonus, just from how high my compassion is, I'm still okay. So same thing happens if they were in his space, they move away, but they aren't, they get plus one. And they get a wild, which I assume means I can replace a die that's already there with a better one. All right, let's keep going. Next turn, I should be able to reach it. Rawr! We want justice, or whatever they say. <laughs> what do they got this time? All virtues reroll their donate and reserved dice. Remove any wilds rolled. I had three wilds, that's annoying, but I didn't get any now, so haha, I kept my dice. Increase the shadow threshold, so now there can be four on the board, and minus one clarity, which again is not what I'm using, so that's okay. Oh wait, that affects exploring, I'm plus two instead of plus three, so that is annoying. Okay, one scout moves two south, so <laughs> one of these guys is like, never mind. But then a southernmost scout moves to north and then searches, so he gets into our place. But nobody's attacked yet because the shadows haven't reached me, or are they about to? Uh, each shadow moves two to engage. Ha, you can't reach me. If he had, he would have taken away a strength and triggered a fight. How about you up here, friend? One, two, no, you're not there yet. And actually, I guess I could have gone here. That way I can get to the tree and not have any negatives. But two more spawning on X and Y again. Yeah, these cards are nastier. Of course, at this point, I'm already so leveled up. It doesn't matter that much, but you can imagine how tough this would be if I had uh, been playing like this the whole time. Oh, I forgot. I'm definitely going to put in my move two card. I think we're winning this turn. So, bloop, 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 bloop. Okay, I'm going to do... I'm going to do a regular talk, because it can't hurt to do so. I uh, don't need to move regular. I'm going to do a that, and a that, and uh, we'll reroll this. That's not what I needed. But that's okay, because we've got two for sagacity here. We've got that, so we can talk to a regular villager first. Uh, then move. Oh, wait, I don't have my uh, spirit on the board. That's plus three. All right, so we'll slow down. We won't do the explore this turn. We'll just get uh, these guys here. Could I have done that? Nope. So first I'll put Providence on the board to give me plus three again so I can't fail the talk. Then I'll move to the tree and then I'll do sagacity for the explore next turn. So the talk automatically succeeds. So I can push this villager away again. I get a wild in my reserve. That'll help. Oh, wait, hold on, hold on. I forgot I can place my virtue on the board with my blessing. So then with that, I can use my O2 wilds, go down one in clarity, and I can explore this turn with the bonuses. Cool. So I get all the way over here with him, and they all, I guess, follow me within one. And I've got plus three, I think I kept track of all of them, from talking to the villagers. Four more from sagacity, so that's seven. Three from my virtue, that's ten. One more from clarity, that's eleven. And I've got two redraws. I don't think two was enough, was it? Let's go one more time. There we go, fifteen, I'm sure that's enough. Indeed it is. A 13 plus on the explore check. Chapter 10a. I think it's the best ending. Ezra's lashed tightly to the tree so he can scarce breathe, let alone struggle. They turn to leave him as he yammers and gibbers, gibbers in human sounds and then falls silent, staring at the sky with terrible intensity. They walk away across the fen and Cain casts a last look at the grotesque form bound to the tree, seeming in the uncertain light like a great fungus growing to the bowl. And suddenly the miser screams hideously, Death! Death! There are skulls in the stars! Life was good to him, though he was gnarled and churlish and evil, Cain sighs. Mayhap God has a place for such souls where fire and sacrifice may cleanse them of their dross, as fire cleans the forest of fungus things. Yet my heart is heavy within me. Nay, sir, one of the villagers speaks. <laughs> you have done but the will of God, and good alone shall come of this night's deed. Nay, answers Cain heavily, I know not. I know not. Then far away, the red disk of the moon rises over the fen, and for an instant, a grim silhouette is etched blackly against it. A thing like a flying shadow, a nameless, shapeless horror rises around the tree in Ezra. Then they merge into one unnameable, formless mass and vanish in the shadows. Far across the fen sounds a single shriek of terrible laughter. All right. 
Major victory. Wow, we all made it. If you watched this far, thanks so much for sticking with it. That was Salomon Kane. Again, you can see my review video, which is separate. I uh, hope you enjoyed the story, and thanks for watching. Good gaming, and we'll see you at the next stop.